Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. Welcome, my darlings. Please have a seat. Today, I'm dealing more with fairy abductions and how they relate to 411. Um, this one is from a well-documented case way back in history. I'm getting it from a blog. From blogger Neil Rushton, his blog, Dead But Dreaming. And it is... The Fairy Abduction of Anne Jeffries. Fairy fair and fairy bright, come and be my chosen sprite. Moon shines bright, water runs clear. I am here, but where is my fairy dear? Attributed to Anne Jeffries in Robert Hunt, Popular Romances of West of England. Outside the dramatic inventions of Shakespeare, Drayden, Henrik, and all, most accounts of human interactions with fairies from the earlier modern period are derived from the desperate records of witch trials. These records often chronicle the accused witch's testimony usually under torture, of consorting with fairy familiars for the purpose of divination, healing, and sometimes flying to sabbats. Historians such as Carlo Ginsberg and Emma Wilby have teased out the details from the trial records to create a convincing argument that they are encoded genius evidence of shamanic practice among the witches, who were frequently able to intersect with the fairy in a dissociated, altered state of consciousness. The records supply us with the largest body of documentary evidence for the ontology of the fairies between the 16th and 18th century. But there is one unusual case that comes down to us from different sources, and yet contains many of the motifs usually contained in witch trials. This is the story of Anne Jeffreys from St. Teeth, close to the north coast of Cornwall. I hope I'm saying that right. Anne Jeffreys' story. Anne Jeffreys was 19 when she went into service in 1645 with the wealthy Pitt family on their country estate near St. Teeth. A description of what happened to her is contained in a letter dated 1696, from Moses Pitt to the Right Reverend Dr. William Fowler, Bishop of Gloucestershire. Moses was a young boy when Anne was in service with his parents, and the letter seems to be, in part, a memoir, but also a request for some Christian explanatory guidance from the bishop, although there is no record of any reply. The letter found its way into the hands of the 19th century folklorist and scientist Robert Hunt, who was able to supplement the details with his own collection of local oral testimony, where the story had evidently been doing its rounds for over 150 years. Hunt's literary rendering of the story appeared in his 1865 publication, popular romances of the West of England, along with extracts from Moses Pitt's letter. Hunt's folkloric version is worth quoting in full, although, as we'll see, it's not the end of the strangeness surrounding Anne. Anne Jeffreys was the daughter of a poor laboring man who lived in the parish of St. Teeth. She was born in 1626, and is supposed to have died in 1698. When she was 19 years old, Anne, who was a remarkably sharp and clever girl, went to live as a servant in the family of Mr. Moses Pitt. Anne was an unusually bold girl, 
and would do things which even boys feared to attempt. Of course, in those days, everyone believed in fairies, and everyone feared those little airy beings. Side note, they weren't always little airy beings. This was a Victorian change of them. They were often quite tall and often quite vicious, but it does seem that Anne was looking for the pixie type. They were constantly the talk of people, and this set Anne longing anxiously to have an interview with some of them. So Anne went often abroad after sundown, turning up the fern leaves and looking into the bells of the foxgloves to find a fairy, singing all the time, Fairy fair and fairy bright, come and be my chosen sprite. She never allowed a moonlit night to pass without going down into the valley and walking against the stream singing, Moon shines bright, water runs clear, I am here. But where is my fairy dear? The fairies were a long time trying this poor girl, for as they told her afterwards, they never lost sight of her. But there they would be, looking on when she was seeking them, and they would run from frond to frond of the ferns when she was turning them up in her anxious search. One day Anne, having finished her morning's work, was sitting in the arbor in her master's garden, when she fancied she heard someone move aside the branches, as though endeavoring to look in upon her, and she thought it must be her sweetheart, so she resolved to take no notice. Anne went on steadily with her work. No sound was heard, but the regular beat of the knitting needles, one upon the other. Presently she heard a suppressed laugh, and then again a rustle amid the branches. The back of the arbor was towards the lane, and to enter the garden it was necessary to walk down the lane to the gate, which was, however, not many yards off. Click, click went the needles. Click, click, click. At last Anne began to feel vexed that the intruder did not show himself, and she pettishly said half aloud, You may stay there till Cuny, Master Mildew, grows up. On the gate, ere I'll come to E. There was immediately a peculiar ringing and a very music laugh. Anne knew this was not her lover's laugh, and she felt afraid. But it was bright day, and she assured herself that no one would do her any mischief, as she knew herself to be a general favorite in the parish. Presently Anne felt assured that the garden gate had been carefully opened and closed again, so she waited anxiously the result. In a few moments she perceived, at the entrance of the arbor, six little men, all clothed very handsomely in green. They were beautiful little figures, and had very charming faces, and such bright eyes. The grandest of these little visitors wore a red feather in his cap, advanced in front of the others, and, making a most polite bow to Anne, addressed her familiarly in the kindest words. This gentleman looked so sweetly on Anne that she was charmed beyond measure, and she put down her hand as if shaking hands with her little friend when he jumped onto her palm, and she lifted him into her lap. Then he, without any more ad, clambered upon her bosom and neck, and began kissing her. Anne never felt so charmed in her life as while this one little gentleman was playing with her. But presently he called his companion, and they all clambered up by her dress as best they could, and kissed her neck, her lips, and her eyes. One of them ran his fingers over her eyes, and she felt as if she had been pricked with a pin. Suddenly Anne became blind and she felt herself whirled through the air at a great rate. And, by and by, one of her little companions said something which sounded like, Tear away! And lo! Anne had her sight at once restored, and she was in one of the most beautiful places, temples and palaces of gold and silver, trees laden with fruit and flowers, 
lakes full of gold and silverfish, and the air full of birds of the sweetest song, and the more brilliant colors. Hundreds of ladies and gentlemen were walking about. Hundreds more were idling in the most luxurious bowers. The fragrance of the flowers oppressing them with the sense of delicious repose. Hundreds were also dancing, engaged in sports of various kinds. Anne was, however, surprised to find that these happy people were no longer the small people she had previously seen. There was now no more than the difference usually seen in a crowd between their height and her own. Anne found herself arrayed in the most highly decorated clothes. So grand indeed did she appear that she doubted her identity. Anne was constantly attended by her six friends, but the finest gentleman, who was the first to address her, continued her favorite, at which the others appeared to be very jealous. Eventually, Anne and her favorite contrived to separate themselves, and they retired into some of the most lovely gardens. And they retired into some of the most lovely gardens, where they were hidden by the luxuriance of the flowers. Lovingly did they pass the time, and Anne desired that this should continue forever. However, when they were at the happiest, there was heard a great noise, and presently the five other fairies, at the head of a great crowd, came after them in a violent rage. Her lover drew his sword to defend her, but this was soon beaten down, and he lay wounded at her feet. Then the fairy who had blinded her again placed his hands upon her eyes, and all went dark. She heard strange noises and felt herself whirled about and about, and as if a thousand flies were buzzing around her. At length her eyes were opened, and Anne found herself on the ground in the arbor where she had been sitting in the morning, and many anxious faces were around her. All conceived that she was recovering from a convulsive fit. According to Moses Pitt, Anne only related her experience at a later date, after she seems to have acquired healing abilities. This was after her mistress slipped and broke her leg. Anne convinced her to allow her to lay her hands on the leg over the course of the next few days thereby healing the fracture without the need to call a surgeon. Under further interrogation, Anne told her that she had been told about the accident by the fairies and that she would be able to heal her mistress's leg through some type of osmotic fairy power. Once this was admitted, Anne spilled the beans about what had happened to her when she'd fallen into convulsion in the arbor. She also confessed that the fairies were now frequently visible to her, but to no one else, and that it was through them and their otherworldly influence that she found herself with clairvoyant abilities and the ability to go long periods without eating any food, claiming that she did not need to as the fairies supplied her with special bread that sustained her. Pitt also chronicles her apparent ability to make herself invisible, something which she explained as another gift of the fairies, to be used sparingly and without malice. Word of Anne's healing and clairvoyant faculties soon spread throughout the county and beyond, bringing a steady stream of visitors to partake of her service, for which she never charged. Unfortunately, this brought her to the attention of the notorious... Cornish magistrate, Jan Tregagel, who issued a warrant for her arrest on the basis that she was consorting with the devil. She was duly imprisoned at the residence of the mayor of Bodmin. She avoided being tried as a witch, although there was mo no more than 15 witch trials in Cornwall throughout the main period of the witch craze in the 17th and 18th century. A small number compared to some other counties such as Essex and Somerset. Only a decade later, in the 1650s, there was a mass trial of 25 alleged witches at the courts of Assize in Lashton, 
six of whom were found guilty and hanged. Anne was lucky to escape such a fate. She was, however, deprived of food while imprisoned, but her fairy allies once again came to her aid and kept her fed with their thaumaturgic bread. Interestingly, in 1647, document containing correspondence from the mayor, now held in the Clarendon Manuscript Archives, confirms Anne's presence in the jail and that she was deprived of food for several months without any apparent de detriment to her health. This is another piece of tantalizing evidence to suggest the strangeness surrounding Anne's life. Anne was released without trial and went to live with a widowed aunt of Moses Pitt near Padstow. Later marrying a laborer named William Warren, she continued to cure people throughout her life by the laying on of hands and becoming a strict Episcopalian. But whether she continued to consort with the fairies is unknown. In 1693, in the hope of gleaning some more details about her supernatural visitors, Moses Pitt, living in London, sent a friend, Humphrey Martin, to interview her. But in a letter from Martin to Pitt, he made it clear that she was not willing to divulge any details of her experience of her later life. As for Anne Jeffreys, I have been with her the greater part of one day, and did read to her all that you wrote to me, but she would not own anything of it, as concerning the fairies, neither of any of the cures she did. I asked her the reason why she would not do it. She replied that if she should discover it to you, and that you would make books and ballads of it, and she said that she would not have her name spread about the country in books and ballads of such things, if she might have five hundred pounds for it. The memory of her time incarcerated, at the mayor of Bodmin's pleasure, and the fear of repeating the experience, would almost certainly have been another reason for her to hold her tongue. Anne Jeffreys died in 1698. Some Interpretations Anne's experience of abduction by the fairies bears many similarities with the recorded confessions of witches on trial in the 17th century. There's much evidence suggest that these witches were recalling metaphysical rather than physical events, and that they were achieved flight, contact with fairy familiars, and journeying to fairyland, or Anne Sabbaths, via an altered state of consciousness brought about by a variety of methods. This correlates with shamanic practices, and several authors have suggested that this is what underlay the witch's experience. Many of the core attributes of shamanism described by Mercier, Elad, and many anthropologists since find resonance in the practice of pre-modern witches through a variety of methods, including ingestions of psychotropic plants and mushrooms, fasting, dance, illness, sensory deprivation. The shaman falls into an ecstatic state. His, her body is left in a cataleptic state while their consciousness is removed elsewhere. Always with the aid of a totem animal. The shaman's consciousness either becomes the animal or it's guided by an animal during their out-of-body experience, enabling them to travel to a variety of metaphysical realms and bring back the required or sought information. During these ecstasies, the shaman is able to encounter other shamans, both friendly and hostile, who similarly disassociate their consciousness from their physical selves. These are the basic components of the witch's ecstasies, described through the medium of their Christian persecutors. Whether these visionary episodes were remnants of pre-Christian Eurasian shamanism, or whether they were diffused from marginal societies in parts of Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, and Siberia, where shamanism survived in various forms throughout the period, 
remains equivocal, but the ontological correlation strongly suggests there was a medieval and early modern heretical witch cult in many parts of Europe, existing beneath the prevailing Christian orthodoxy, which utilizes aspects of shamanism as its modus operandi. Uh, that is from fairy familiars and zoomorphic witches, which explains the many long words. Mm -hmm. My own note, uh, just that the old practices survived after Christianity moved into the areas of, well, all over Europe and further east. Back to Neil. Anne's newfound healing abilities after a visit to Fairyland certainly have shamanic undertones, but she was never accused of being a witch, and her experiences do not suggest that she was ever involved with any other practicing witches. Her original adventure was unexpected, and whilst many of the story's motifs find commonality with the confessions of tried witches, Anne's narrative retains a unique personal quality that sets it apart from trial records. However, the details of the story, including flight, immersion in a fairy realm, and the ability to continue communion with supernatural beings, do suggest that Anne was accessing a metaphysical reality through an altered state of consciousness. The clues built into surviving documents suggest this might have been caused by a neurological condition, it is clear from both Hunt's version of the story and Moses Pitt's letter that she was prone to distemper and convulsive fits, and Pitt reports her as saying that, You know that this my sickness and fits come very suddenly upon me. These seizures sound like epilepsy, more specifically temporal lobe epilepsy. This condition has been linked to a variety of transcendental and mystical experiences, with many modern testimonies of those with the condition matching several of the components of Anne's description of her abduction. Clifford Pickover has summarized some of these experiences where people with frequent bursts of electrical activity in their temporal lobes report sensations of flying, floating, or leaving the body as well as other mystical experiences. The onset of an epileptic episode often includes a tingling or pricking of the eyes prior to loss of vision, just as reported by Anne after the fairies crawled onto her in the arbor. One of the most detailed explorations of this condition and how it relates to transcendent experiences is Eve Leplant is Eve Laplante's 1993 book, Seized. She uses historic and contemporary examples to demonstrate that temporal lobe epilepsy can provide access to an altered state of consciousness, where the human mind participates in a reality, several steps removed from the consensus of the material world. This often includes full immersion in alternative landscapes and contact with non-human intelligence. Interestingly, LeBlanc also links the condition to personality change and creative energy, again providing parallels with Anne's story. Hidden or diagnosed, admitted or unknown, the mental states that occur in temporal lobe epileptic seizures are more than simply neurological symptoms. People with temporal lobe epilepsy whether or not they know the physiological cause of their seizures, often incorporate their symptoms into poems, stories, and myths. And the disorder does more than provide the stuff of religious experience and creative work. Temporal lobe epilepsy is associated with personality change, even when seizures are not occurring. It amplifies the very traits that draw people to religion, healing, and art. She also suggests that the condition might be responsible for the reliably bizarre phenomenon of alien abduction. She notes that one of the most famous alien abductees 
Whitley Strieber, admitted to a magnetic resonance imaging scan that revealed occasional punctuated foci of high signal intensity in his left temporal, temporal partial region, which is suggestive of scarring that could lead to temporal lobe epilepsy. As detailed in previous posts, shaman, fairies, aliens, and DMT, researchers such as Jacques Vallée and Graham Hancock made convincing arguments for the tight relations between fairy abductions in folklore and alien abductions in the 20 and 21st centuries. The experiences are culturally co coded to time and place, but the correlations and similarities are intriguing and might suggest a common source for the phenomena. UFO researcher Chris Albeck and Jenny Randalls have even insinuated that Anne Jeffrey's stories had all the attributes of a modern-day alien abduction scenario. Obviously, it cannot be definitely proven that Anne Jeffrey suffered from temporal lobe epilepsy, and the relationship between folkloric fairy abductions and modern alien abductions remains tentative. But Anne's unusually well-documented case does allow us to speculate that she did experience life-changing, supernatural contact whilst in some form of altered consciousness. The question remains, who were the fairies and where was the fairyland in Anne's story? If she were genuinely describing her flight to an alternative reality and the retention of contact with metaphysical beings, was it real? The answer may reside with Anne's belief in the fairies. The story and Moses Pitt's correspondence made it clear that she did believe in the objective reality of supernatural fairy entities, even before she met them. It simply took the circumstances of an altered state of consciousness, perhaps in the form of an epileptic seizure, for her to realize this reality. As usual with both folkloric fairy encounters and modern experiences, we need to allow for the possibility that consciousness is not constrained to what is usually considered consensus, physical reality. Just as for shamans and witches, the potential for consciousness to access non-physical realities by bypassing the usual neurological confinements may explain interaction with non-human intelligence and the matrix in which they usually live. The ex-NASA scientist and out-of-body phenomenon adherent, Tom Campbell, has coined the phrase entering a different data stream to explain the ontological reality of what the mind experiences when it is freed from its incarceration in the brain. It is simply a different reality with different rules. If, like Anne Jeffries, you believe in fairies, however culturally coded, that is what your consciousness will bring to the table if it is allowed to do so. And again, I thank Neil Rushton for allowing me to share his blog on here. Um, this is some heavy stuff, I know. It's not the usual fare. Everything I seem to be looking at and studying seems to be coming together. Um, the missing 411 linked to the fairies, linked to the witches, which is linked to skinwalkers who are a form of witches, and the uh, creatures that parallel the fairies in um, native, I hate to call it folklore or mythology even, um, beliefs that link back to the 411. It's all kind of strange how it's all tying together but um while Anne seemed to possibly have only gone to these places in her mind and whether her mistress had a broken leg or a sprain that was able to heal in a few days that is up to you um her going so long without food and water is quite unusual. Um, 
especially it being documented. I know there are some people out there. There's that crazy Russian model who um, claims to be an alien and survives only on sunlight. She's had a lot of plastic surgeries, though, to look the way she does, if you know who I mean. Um, anyway, this is just another little link between the fairies. Science has come around to the idea of mm, parallel universes and other universes that are quite different and that they bump up against our own. And whether travel between them is possible is out there. If they've come to the government and important people and said, we're here, we haven't been told. But who knows? I'm not saying one way or another. I'm just putting out this possibility. Um, many of the, I'm going to cover, I'm going to read a reply about what abductees from these national parks and wild places have said when they've come back. The ones who come back, the ones who survive are always children, it seems, or mostly or special needs, that they can't communicate well. But I'm going to read you a series of what these children have explained, what they've seen, probably in the next week or so. <laughs> uh, we can go from there. Um, if you like these, please give it a like. So I know whether you want me to continue um, this armchair investigation of these phenomena. Um, if there's other things that you do like and would rather hear, please let me know be below. While I'm just sitting here and speaking to you, which I don't normally do, I have another story by Saki coming up. He's always been, in the long run, a very good thing for me. I've read two of his stories, and they're two of the three highest viewed stories I have on my channel. And so I'm going to do another one. I have some more Natalie Brown for you next time. And we will go from there. So there's a little bit of what's coming up, my darlings. Thank you for joining me around my fire in my lovely little study. A special thank you to my Patreon supporters, Ermine Case and Darren and Jennifer Daw. If you like this, please hit the little button to let me know. If you didn't, hit the little button to let me know. Leave a comment. I'm always glad to talk with you, my darlings. I'm open to suggestions and criticisms, critiques. If you have not subscribed, please do so and ring the little bell so you know when to come up and see me. And I will talk to you next time, my darlings. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs>